Hello guys, this is Trinity Storm here and welcome back to my channel. Today, I am going to do first part of what if Naruto was the savior of the holy grail. If you enjoy this video, please like, share and subscribe to my channel. Now wasting no more time, let's start the story. The holy grail war of Fuyuki, also known as Heaven's Feel, is a 200 year old ritual. It was founded as a means to reach Akasha by the Tasaka, Matu, and Ainsburn families, and is now thought to be a competition for something recognized as a possible holy grail. The grail chooses seven magi as masters and allows them to summon seven servants to do battle with their help. The winning pair is supposed to claim the holy grail and use it to grant each of them a wish. Its true purpose is to use the seven servants returning to the root to form a direct path to it. Saber, Sword Servant Lancer, Spear Servant Servant of the Bow, Archer Servant of the Mount, Rider Caster, Magecraft Servant Servant of Madness, Berserker Servant of the Shadows, Assassin. Those seven, along with seven Magus, fight in the Holy Grail War to have their wishes granted. Those seven servants keep the Grail balanced in the path to the Akasha open. Until the Third Holy Grail War took place. Avenger. Those whose lives were spent seeking vengeance, whether for themselves or others. It is not a true class. It is merely a substitute. It was never intended to be used, because few heroes of the past could have filled the category, and the gifts of being an Avenger were rarely welcomed. The person known as Avenger had been summoned out of frustration and slaughtered before the folly could be discovered. In life, he had been a sacrifice for all that is sin, all that is evil, all that is abhorrent to mankind. He had done what he had done in life in his death as a servant, so it was not the soul of an innocent, but the soul of an avenging hero that was swept into the Holy Grail. No. What it was. What it is. It is called sin. It is the Antichrist. It is everything that humanity despises, despises, and despises about itself. All of this and more was poured into the Holy Grail until it was no longer what it had been. This blackened grail was devoid of holiness. Avengers summoned hellish monstrosity took care of that quite well. Even in the darkest of times. A spark, a tiny speck of light that still shines, a soul willingly sacrificed so that a shared dream can be realized together can exist. The Holy Grail has become tainted controlled by all of the world's evils, but there is enough of its core, of her original self, that remains, that remembers. All rules are designed to be broken. And the Avenger isn't the only extra class that can be referred to. Ruler, they who sat on their thrones and pedestals as the people below looked up to them to obey their every word and command. This is a class that any royal can claim, but it is not reserved for these self-righteous and frequently pretentious fools. No, it is the right of those who inspire faith and loyalty, as well as those who are led as much as they lead. Savor. They who are the saviors of mankind, especially in death, according to some. Every one of them is a messiah, for they are the holiest figures of mankind, chosen by fate, guided by destiny, and protected by the Almighty. This is a class that sits above the throne of heroes rather than on it. Because they are only second to the king of kings. The Holy Grail War's purpose, their design, is to be the saving force when everything else has failed, when the degradation has gone so far beyond redemption that only the living embodiments of purity, good, and all that is decent can reform what has become broken. However, what remained of the true Grail could not make use of either of them. The ruler is to be the judge, the arbiter between the final four wish fighters and saver. No, the corruption was too great for the calling to reach such a hero's ear no one would be able to clean up the mess. It was far too potent. The only way to do so is to completely destroy it until nothing remains. But it will not be easy. Even with the assistance of a servant, it will not be enough. Even Excalibur couldn't destroy it in another dimension. But the heart of Grail will not give up. There must be something to do. If Aya, the second most powerful noble phantasm, couldn't destroy it, she'd have to summon a hero from another world. When Arturia Pendragon's Excalibur struck the Grail, 
Angra Mainyu separated himself for a brief moment to avoid destruction and turned itself to mud. That amount of time allowed her to look for a hero capable of destroying this evil. Thus, with all of her remaining power, the Grail Corps used all of her might to contact someone. To look for a savior. To keep the world's evils from being born. Another dimension. Pure world. He was overjoyed. He'd be happy even if he were dead. The battles he endured when he was alive. Even the older generation admitted that it was the bloodiest war they had ever witnessed. Hundreds of thousands, if not millions, have died. The enemy consisted of only three people. However, those three people were able to summon an invincible beast and dead people to assist them. In the end, their adversary reduced to one. Only one. But that one person was not ordinary. She was a deity. If she wanted, she could create new worlds in a single day. She could also destroy them. She could bring down a massive mountain with a single punch, and she could launch massive planets like baseballs. She is the death and creation goddess. Kagaya, Sutsuki. But he eventually defeated her. He defeated the invincible goddess and sealed her back into the moon with the help of his friends, comrades, and family. Thus began his true journey. Fighting with a friend whom he considered a brother. Rebuilding the ruined land. Fighting yet another foe who kidnapped his lover and threatened to destroy his world. And he finally realized his dream, saving his friend, his brother. He started a family. A lovely and cute daughter, a lovely and lovely wife, and a handsome and funny son. All of his friends were also in good situations. They each had their own families, and some of their children married his. He was able to bring all nations together and bring peace to the world. Yes, he knew it wasn't perfect peace. But there will always be conflict, no matter what era. It was unbreakable and absolute. There was also conflict during his time. But, in the end, there was still peace. The vast majority of his people live in harmony. For him, it was a win-win situation. We now find him sitting in front of a campfire. Oh man, I'm bored. He stated with a bored and dull expression. It's been. A hundred years? Yes, it could have been a hundred years after his death. He had already met his friends who had come here both before and after his death. He met his deceased friends and comrades, as well as his parents. They had already reunited. It was a happy time, full of joy and tears of joy. He recalled meeting his daughter with his mother. Ah, yes. His mother squeezed the poor little girl into a bone-crushing hug. But, while it was a happy time, what was it called after spending so many years in this? Pure world, yes. He was bored after spending so many years in pure world. He's already been here for a long time. He and his friend were unique among the other souls in this place. They have the chakra of Rakud Senan. They both have a unique soul. While they are still dead, his soul is as strong as it was when he was alive. He may have lost most of his abilities in here, but he was still a hell of a fighter. A light appeared not far from his location, drawing his attention. All right, who is dead and came here? Even in the pure world, only a few people are aware of my location. He thought with his eyes narrowed. When the light went out, a figure emerged from it. The figure was a woman with long snow-white hair, a doll-like face described as too beautiful and too well-crafted, ruby-red pupils, and pale skin even paler than Uchiha's. The woman was dressed in a lovely white gown with seven-ring decorations. The woman slowly turned to face him and smiled. Hello, Naruto Uzumaki. Naruto blinked as she greeted him. Naruto is a twenty-year-old man with blonde hair and cerulean blue eyes. His hair was a spiky, sun-kissed blonde with two bangs on either side of his face. He was dressed in an orange cape with a high collar and a black flame pattern on the back, with the kanji for emperor written on it. He was dressed in a black sleeveless jacket, 
white shinobi pants with a kanai holster on the right, and black shinobi shoes. Before speaking, Naruto looked up and down at the lady in front of him. Yo. Hello there, young lady. Naruto returned the greeting. She, she, she. She's not dead. She is alive, but she is also not. A soul? A free soul unattached to this land. Naruto reflected as he sensed this woman's aura. You know who I am, but I don't know who you are. What is your given name? He inquired. I'm Justice Lizrick von Einsburn. As she introduced herself, Justice smiled. Lyrit von Bain's Ben, Justice? Naruto repeated with a blink, and people call my name strange. He murmured as he remembered how everyone called him Fishcake instead of Maelstrom. Justice couldn't help but shiver when he heard the nickname. It's not her fault she has a long name. She chuckled at Naruto's expression. Uzumaki Naruto, this is Justice. This is not Justice. She said it again, and Naruto looked at her for a moment before shrugging. Meh. To me, it sounds the same. I'll address you as lady. He said it casually, why don't you take a seat, lady? You must have come here to discuss something, right? Naruto stated as he patted a nearby rock. Justice nodded and moved to take a seat next to Naruto. She took a moment to look at the fire in front of her before saying, I need your help. She stated. Oh? As you can see, lady, I'm already dead. Naruto frowned. He made a deadpan. I'll be honest with you, Uzumaki Naruto, I'm not from this world. Justice stated this while ignoring Naruto's remark. Naruto, who was hearing this, narrowed his eyes before his face became solemn. I can tell because you don't have a chakra. Not to mention that you have no ties to this land. You seem to be taking this quite well. Lady, I've already met a woman who could create new worlds in a single day, complete with a new sun and moon. I've also met an evil version of myself and had to defeat him in order to save his world. It's not surprising to hear someone from another world. Naruto laughed as he remembered fighting Kagaya and Menma. I see. Justice accepted the answer with a nod. So, what exactly do you want me to do? And how are you going to bring me back to life? After brief explanation. Please allow me to clarify. See you're one of the creators of this holy grail thing that involves summoning seven warriors to fight a war between seven people. Yes. This grail thing can grant any wish, such as going back in time, resurrecting someone, and seeing the future. Yes. However, none of the participants in the last four wars managed to win, save for this man named Karitsugu Emiya, who was able to see the true nature of the corrupted grail and used his servant to destroy it. Yes. The reason you made this. Grail thing is to get to what you call Akasha. Yes. However, it is now only one of three families who intend to reach this Akasha thing. While the other two seek the grail for selfish reasons, your family foolishly attempts to summon an evil god as their servant, only to fail, and now the evil god has corrupted the grail, so any wish granted will result in the destruction of your world. Yes. And now you've come here to recruit me, to become this servant thing so I can completely destroy this grail. Yes. I'm sorry, lady but your family is a bunch of jerks. Naruto finally deadpanned after recalling everything. What the fuck is the matter with her family? They were only defeated twice. If they had patience, who knows, maybe they could win the third war, but no way. They're jerks and a stupid, arrogant family. See what happened to this grail thing as a result of them. Hundreds of people died as a result of this. This family needed to be smacked. Naruto made a mental note that if he ever met the current head of the family, he would kill her, him so that the head of the family would be replaced by a new one who has at least a brain to lead her family in a new light. When Justice heard Naruto's comment, he only let out a sad sigh. What Naruto said is true. Even she was surprised, given that her family was the ones who ruined the grail.
Ironically, she was the one who proposed creating the Grail in the first place, and her descendant was the one who destroyed it. Yes, that is correct. As much as I dislike admitting it, my family has fallen. Justice muttered angrily. And now, if I follow you, I'll be permanently removed from my world and seated on the throne of Hero, as you promised, the moment I die? As Naruto's recall continues. Yes, your soul will be imprisoned in my world. Of course, it is fixable if you meet with Kishua Zelret Schweinord. He possesses magic that allows him to travel between dimensions. Justice brought this up. That is, if I survive the Holy Grail War. Ju stays grimaced as Naruto retorted with a dull face, and now for Lady. We've arrived at the crucial point. Why should I assist you? Naruto inquired, his arm crossed and his eyes narrowed, believe me, I'm a nice guy, and I admit it, but what you're asking of me is different. Do you want me to cut ties with my family and friends, to travel to a new world where I know nothing except what I've learned from this throne of hero thing? Why should I help you? His eyes became sharp and turned to slits. Justice turned to face Naruto, her face solemn but with a hint of pleading in her eyes. She sighed and returned her gaze to the fire in front of her. I know I don't deserve your assistance. I came here uninvited, barging into your world then asking for your assistance, but you will be separated from your entire family and entering a new world that you were unaware of. I won't be surprised if you, Justice remarked dryly. Ah hell, let's cut the crap and go. Justice blinked before turning to Naruto, surprised. Naruto only grinned at her after standing up and stretching his muscles. Are you certain? Justice inquired, surprised, seeing Naruto immediately change his heart. Yes, yes, yes. Now wait a moment while I say goodbye to my family. Naruto replied by waving his hand. There's a chance you'll never see them again. You sure you want to do this with all of your friends and family? Lady, when I say yes, I really mean it. My ninja way is to never back down from my words. Naruto stated with a smirk. Justice was taken aback. She can't believe this man, who she barely knew, was willing to give up everything to help her. But he has already given so much to assist her. Thank you. Naruto Uzumaki, she said with a beautiful smile on her face and joy in her eyes. She stated truthfully. Hey. Don't bring it up. By the way, what about my strength when I enter your world? How strong will I be? Naruto inquired. That's right. Of course, you will return to your prime condition. But, because you come from another world, there will be something that will not be returned to you. Justice responded, and Naruto nodded in agreement. If he was back in his prime, he'd still be a badass. He had a feeling he wouldn't be able to use Rakud mode again. That mode was overkill, so it was understandable. In that form, he was easily capable of destroying a god. Not to mention Gudama, truth-seeking ball. That tiny sphere was obviously dangerous. It has the ability to destroy anything. Not only did it destroy, but it also turned everything it touched into nothing. Gone. Disappeared. It obliterated its existence. He admitted that the thing was dangerous. Well. So. Then. I'm going to say goodbye to my family. Wait a minute, Justice. Naruto said as he ran away. It's Justice. With a sweat drop, Justice murmured. His family is nothing out of the ordinary. He was well aware. They had a Magus ancestry, but it wasn't anything special like Tasaka, Matu, or Einsburns. His family has only five generations and is not as wealthy as the other three. They do, however, specialize in formal craft and witchcraft. Despite the fact that many members of the Mages Association thought it was inefficient and useless. That made him laugh. Formal craft and witchcraft may appear simple, but they should not be underestimated. Formal craft and witchcraft, with a good connection, knowledge, and plenty of prana, can be quite dangerous, if not fatal. 
Tu San. Tu San. When he heard a familiar voice calling him, he blinked. He turned away from his work to see it was his daughter who had done it. When he saw her, he smiled softly. In his family, his daughter is a blessing. Even though she is only 18 years old, she has already surpassed him in their family's magic. Because of his daughter, their formal craft magic had expanded beyond what he could imagine. Granted, she only had average magic circuits for Amagus, but they were rich and even powerful. What exactly is it, darling? He smiled at his daughter. His daughter slowly lifted her pale hand, revealing an unusual tattoo on the back of her hand. His eyes widened the moment he saw it. This appeared on my arm while I was at school today. She explained. It was called Command Spell. Meanwhile, in Throne of Heroes, with a certain shinobi. This is even duller than Pure World. Naruto did a deadpan. After saying his final goodbyes to Hanada, Himawari, Bolt, Minato, Kashina, Aruka, Rookie 9, Sai, and Team Guy, as well as everyone he knew. He immediately returned to Justice, and the two of them left. His family and friends were hesitant to let him go because it meant they wouldn't see him again. But when Naruto pointed out that he might be able to meet them again because he only needed to meet with someone named Zaret or something, they let him go. After all, they were familiar with Naruto. If there was one thing that was certain, it was that Naruto Uzumaki never broke his word, and it was always proven true. Of course, his parents expected another grandchild if he was going to be gone for an extended period of time, much to Naruto's chagrin. While he is loyal to Hanada, after spending so much time in the living land in the pure world with Hanada, the Hyuga women could eventually accept Naruto having a concubine. Hanada was always too kind for her own good, which isn't a problem since they're both dead. Sure, she can be terrifying when she's jealous, but if she allows it, she means it. Though Naruto only had Hanada as a wife in real life, the pure world is a different story. He and Justice went to this throne of heroes thing after saying their goodbyes to everyone. Justice stated that she can no longer visit him because she is on her last power. After transforming Naruto's soul, she dissipated into particles. The throne of heroes is the place where the hero dies or the hero's mindscape. So Naruto found himself in a large white space, the same space he found himself in when he met Raku Jiji and gained his power. Surrounding the large white space are numerous shuriken, kanai, including the special kanai he created to use Hiraishin no Jutsu, flying thunder god technique, a few giant shuriken, special tantos and swords forged to be stronger than normal steel, sealing scrolls containing his stuff, and other items. Naruto is not a collector in any way. Sure, he has a few cool items, but the majority of the items he gathered aren't noteworthy. However, he does have a trench knife similar to the one Asuma Serutobi has. It allows him to channel any type of chakra into it and is ten times more powerful than Asuma Serutobi's, which was his primary weapon aside from Kanai, Shuriken, and his fists. But now that he's seen all of his possessions, he wishes he'd been a collector all his life. Imagine if he had Kusanagi, Samahata, the petrifying gauntlet, and other cool abilities he'd be able to use it in future battles. Not to mention how jealous that Teme Sasuke would be. Ha! Huh. When he turned around, he saw a massive sword. Cubic Arabic, it was clearly a sword that was used to cut someone's head off. The Demon of Kirigakure's sword. Kakashi returned the sword to the Mizukage after the final battle of the Fourth Shinobi War. However, because of his positive relationship with the Mizukage, it was given to him as a gift and in memory of Zabuza. He didn't use that sword very often because it didn't belong to him, but he did use it occasionally. He can't help but feel relieved now that he sees the situation. He couldn't wait to see how this world reacts when it sees it drink blood. I'm curious what the other heroic spirits are up to in their own throne. As he drew a card, Naruto murmured. After seeing the numbers, he threw it away. Fuck. I'm bankrupt. He yelled as he threw three cards, 
5 spades, 10 spades, and 8 hearts. Before showing his card, the clone in front of him smiled triumphantly, Hey! I'm 18. 8 heart and jack. Much to Naruto's chagrin, Naruto C stated. In gambling, he was unbeatable. He never lost a bet in a casino, as a matter of fact. But how his clone outperformed him in a card game remains a mystery. Karama, a massive nine-tailed fox, is not far from Naruto's position. Naruto was overjoyed when he saw his old friend again. He even jumped in delight and proceeded to insult the fox so they could resume their ranting and insulting each other. But he came to a halt when he saw the fox eyes. True, the fox wasn't as big as it once was, and it only had half of its power, just like when his father sealed it into him, but his eyes meant nothing. Its red eyes, which used to gleam with annoyance, grumpiness, and sarcasm, are now empty. Naruto realized at that point that the fox in front of him is not Karama. The Shinigami from his world only bonded the fox's chakra to his soul. It had no consciousness and only functioned as a puppet. It saddened him to see something that resembled his friend acting in this manner. Another boss in the game? Naruto C inquired, breaking him from his reverie. You clone, go to hell. Naruto yelled as he kicked the clone in the face, clearly upset about being defeated by his own clone. He was the first. How can he always lose to his own clone in gambling? Then he grimaced as the clone vanished and remembered kicking his own clone. After a brief moment of silence, he leaned back and lay on the ground, staring at the empty white space. These valorous spirits. According to justice, they are people who have accomplished great things in their lives. They are mostly strong and good fighters. Naruto believes they are at least Junin level strong. He learned that there are ten classes, Saber, Lancer, Archer, Caster, Assassin, Berserker, Avenger, Saber, and Ruler. Berserker is without a doubt the strongest, Saber, Archer, or Lancer are the most skilled in battle, Assassin is the most lethal to masters, and Caster is the best defender. Naruto rubbed his chin and made a thoughtful expression. The world where this Holy Grail thing happened appears to be more technologically advanced than his own. Though his world won in medical terms, technology is a different story. Does that mean there will be more fun things? While I have knowledge, experiencing it is a different story. Perhaps I could steal one of these jet things and ride it. I have a riding skill, so this shouldn't be too difficult. Naruto laughed uncontrollably. He blinked as he became aware of his body shifting. He looked down and noticed his leg morphing into particles, and then his entire body. A grin appeared on his face. It appears that he has been summoned. Great. What grade will he be? And who is the person who summons him? Hopefully, he's not an asshole, because if he is, he'll have to kill him, her. After all, he was on a mission to destroy the Holy Grail. And he can't be bothered by a jerk like Master. He could already see that he could stay on this plane as long as he gathered natural chakra. Then it was fine if he was masterless. In fact, it was preferable if he worked alone. Despite the cost, he would be limited to a rank ninjutsu and a plus at most. He couldn't enter Kyubi mode in that state, and even if the new, Karama, helped, it would take a long time to regenerate his power. He closed his eyes and allowed his body to dissipate. After a brief moment of feeling the ground beneath his feet, he slowly opened his blue eyes. He was dressed in the same outfit that he was wearing when he died, an orange high-collared short-sleeved cape with the kanji emperor on the back, a black long-sleeved jacket underneath, and white shinobi pants with black shoes. He no longer wore his headband as emperor. Instead, he wore a Hokage-style hat, but instead of the kanji fire and red color, it had the kanji emperor and was orange. He raised his hand and touched his hat, then looked at the people in front of him and smiled. I'm Naruto Uzumaki, God's Conqueror, Emperor of Shinobi and Samurai. Which of you invited me? Datbeo. In the meantime, in Fuyuki City. 
Kirei Kotamine, mediator of the Fifth Holy Grail War, was sitting in the church at the time. He'd been bored for the past ten years. After finally realizing the nature of the Grail and discovering that it was an existence that should not have been born into this world. Just like him. He was a man who found joy in the suffering of others. In the last ten years, he has enjoyed his time when people came to him for advice on their problems. Instead of helping them, Kirei pointed out their flaws, making them more depressed, sad, and suffering. When he saw their expressions, he was ecstatic. However, after they had finished their torment, Kirei gave them some useful advice for the future. After all, he was still the father of the church. While it was enjoyable, it was nothing like the fires of the grail that burned Fuyuki City ten years ago. Kirei remembered the pleasure and joy he felt while watching the entire city. He remembered how full his laugh sounded, and it was without a doubt the biggest laugh he had ever let out. He'd always wondered how a being like himself, who reveled in other people's misery, could have been born. When he discovered the truth about the grail, he realized it was a larger version of himself, and completing it would allow him to find the answer to his lifelong question. And now the Holy Grail War is back. Kirei looked down at his hand, where the command spells were. Before the Holy Grail War began, he obtained them from his former comrade, Bazit Fraga Makramitz. He took Lancer from her and now had the servant of Spear Scout for him, gathering intelligence on war participants. This time, Kirei ensured that the Grail was completed and that Angra Mainyu was born. So he can finally get the answer he's been looking for. Hum? Kirei blinked as another Grail card, the one depicting summoned servants, flashed, ah? A new servant has been called. I wonder what class I'm in now. He reflected as he flipped the card to reveal the servant class. The card was warm and yellow, and it depicted a man descending from heaven like an angel, his hand extended in a helping gesture. Kirei blinked again when he saw this. What kind of card is this? Saver? Kirei muttered, slightly surprised. He'd never heard of a servant of the Saver class before. Yes, Avenger had heard of that servant being summoned during the Third War. But Saver is different. He's never seen or heard of one. Berserker, Caster, Lancer, Assassin, Rider, and now Saver are the current classes that have been summoned, totaling six servants. Why did another class appear when Archer and Saber were still not summoned? Is Saver going to take the place of Archer or Saber? Or it will appear as an additional servant? Perhaps. Interesting. I can't wait to meet this servant's master. Kirei smirked as he thought. Several days later. To the origin, silver and iron. The Archdukes of Contracts and the gem to the cornerstone Schweinorg, my great master, is the ancestor. The lighted wind transforms into a wall. Coming from the crown, the gates in the four directions close, and the three-forked road leading to the kingdom circulates. Shut, shut, shut. Shut, 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 shut. Repeat five times more. Simply shatter when full. I make an announcement. You will be at my command. Your sword holds my fate. According to the Holy Grail's resort, if you abide by this will, this reason, then answer me. This is my oath. I am the one who becomes all the good of the dead world, and I am the one who lays out all the evil of the dead world. O Keeper of the Balance, you, seven heavens clad in three words of power, have arrived from the Ring of Deterrence. Flash. The moment the Magus finished its chant, a bright light engulfed the entire summoning room. Then. Boom. The entire room was engulfed in an explosion. It's not a flashy one, just an explosion accompanied by crimson lightning. It blew away everything in its path, creating dust as a result of the filthy environment. Tasaka Rin, the current heiress of the Tasaka family in Homurahara Academy's number one school idol, coughed and covered her mouth as smoke filled the room she had used for her ritual. It was nighttime, to be more specific, it was the time when her power was at its peak. 
so it was time to carry out the most important ritual she would ever carry out in her entire life. The ritual she was performing was to summon a servant to participate in the Holy Grail War. Her command seals appeared on her hand not long ago, indicating that the Grail chose her as a master. So, in order to summon a good servant, she needed to be at the pinnacle of her power and ensure that nothing went wrong. That was perfect. I know I got the most potent card. Rin exclaimed enthusiastically as she began to look around. She also had a responsibility as the second owner of Fuyuki City to ensure that no innocent blood was shed during the war, which was one of the reasons she needed to summon a powerful servant. That's why we see Tasaka Rin twitching her eye at the scenery in front of her. Did I mess up? Rin murmured, her right eye twitching, indicating she was not amused. There is, after all, no person or living being in front of her. She couldn't believe it. She'd done everything correctly. She had correctly prepared the summoning circle, her power was at its peak at this precise moment, and there should have been a hero standing directly in front of her instead of an empty space. But she didn't have a catalyst to summon one. A catalyst to summon a heroic spirit is required for a magus to summon a heroic spirit. For example, if you used a Jack the Ripper dagger, the serial killer would appear as your servant. However, obtaining these items or artifacts will be expensive because they are extremely rare and have their own legend. And unfortunately, Tasaka Rin cannot afford to use one because of her financial situation as a result of the Fourth Grail War. Rin had no choice but to rely on chance. She hoped that the hero she summoned would be a great and famous hero, and that if she was really lucky, the hero would also be of the Saber class. Unfortunately, luck was not on her side. If anyone from her school saw her face now, the image of Rin Tasaka, the Academy's elegant, cool, and beautiful idol, would shatter into pieces. However, before she could do anything, she was distracted by the sound of something crashing. The raven-haired girl dashed towards the room's door and was about to open it when she noticed it was locked. The door is shattered. Rin let out a growl, clearly irritated, damn it. Rin screamed and kicked the door open, causing it to fall to the ground. As soon as she walked into the room, she saw a man wearing black onyx armor beneath a unique red coat with only a pair of long sleeves that covered his arms and the lower part of the coat. The man sat with his eyes closed and arrogantly. He had tanned skin and white spiky hair. He slowly opened his eyes, revealing gray orbs and staring at Rin. When he looked at her, he closed his eyes for a second before opening one and smirking. Rin, who was watching the smirk, was irritated by it. Wait. All the clocks in the house were an hour fast today. She thought as she noticed the clock behind the man. Which means it's now 1 a.m. She realized immediately. Not 2 a.m. Rin groaned and clutched her head in annoyance when she saw this. I did it once more. How? How could she have missed this? If she had just paid more attention, she could summon Saber right now. After a brief rant about what had been done and why her father had assigned her this task, she turned to the man and asked, What are you supposed to be? She inquired. Hearing this, the man's eyes narrowed. That's the first thing you say to me? He inquired before smirking and scoffing, it appears that I have been drawn by an unusual little master. Oh my goodness. Or was it I who drew the short straw? He smirked while putting on a disappointed face to Rin, much to the girl's chagrin. Finally, he lamented. Rin ignored the insult and approached the man. Just to be certain. You are, after all, my servant. She insisted. Are you also my master? The man inquired again. You were not present when I was summoned. You are not a young bird. Don't make it sound like you imprint on your master the moment you open your eyes. Riss responded, well, I'm just wondering if you're truly my servant and not someone else's. The master-servant relationship should be clearly defined from the start. She stated with a stern tone and a steely expression. Yeah. The man replied, I completely agree with that assessment. 
But where is the proof that you're my master? He inquired, his face skeptical. Here. Isn't this enough proof for you that I'm your master? Rin replied while showing him her command spells. Oh dear, do you really mean that? The man sighed after staring at her hand for a moment. It wasn't that meaningless token I wanted to see. He asked, his face disappointed. I wanted to see if you are someone worthy of my loyalty, he said as he slowly stood up. As he walked towards Rin, he said. Huh? Rin's eyes narrowed and her face was irritated. Do you mean I'm not worthy of being your master? She inquired, feeling offended, admitting that she had made a mistake in summoning but still. No. Rin noticed that the man in front of her was quite tall. He put one hand on his hip and looked Rin down, I'm completely dissatisfied, but I recognize you as my master. But one thing is certain. In the coming war, I will disregard everything you say. I'll have my own battle strategy. Do you have any objections? With a smirk, he stated his condition, Oju San. He then returned to his seat and sat down again. I see. Rin murmured, her hair casting a shadow over her eyes, you acknowledge me but refuse to listen to my thoughts? Why is this the case? Isn't it true that you're my servant? Yes, in normal circumstances, I will obey your orders, but in battle. He smugly crossed his legs, until this holy grail war is over, I suggest you sit tight in the cellar or something. Rin clenched her fist, but the man was unconcerned, that should keep even one as inexperienced as you alive. He then looked at Rin and smirked as he noticed the clenched fist, have I irritated you? Of course, I have nothing but admiration for your position. Anyway, leave everything to me and take care of yourself. I have no expectations from you. Rin was clearly irritated by this point. Not only did the summoning fail, but she also received this insane servant. He was arrogant and clearly underestimated her. Fine. If you're going to be like that, I'll use one on you. Rin yelled as she raised her hand, widening the man in front of her eyes. Wait. You wouldn't use command spell now, would you? He expressed his disbelief. I certainly would. You lousy ingrate. Retorted Rin. Wait. Are you insane, master? The man asked, standing there in disbelief. Who in their right mind would use a command seal on something so? Stop talking. You are my slave. So you should take my word for it. Rin slashed him before raising her hand. By this command spell, I command you to obey everything I say. The seal instantly glowed with power before unleashing a crimson wave on the area. The man immediately felt the effect when he noticed one of his master's circles had vanished. Are you that rash, girl? Seriously, what kind of master uses command spell just for something like this? The man exclaimed. Rin blushed as he yelled, much to her embarrassment. S stay quiet. She shot back. True, her temper may have won for a brief moment, but in her defense, she has been through a lot today. What exactly is your class? Archer. Rin groaned as Archer responded. Not only does she have a disobedient servant, but it was Archer rather than Saber. L move lets this somewhere else. She muttered something. 8 p.m. the following day in Fuyuki City. This is Fuyuki City, eh? As he stood atop a tall building, Naruto stated. He couldn't help but notice how beautiful the city was. It was lovely. This world, unlike his, was indeed very advanced. He observed that the city's structure, as well as the houses, are of high quality. If he could only show them to Bolt and Himawari. He yearned for the days when they were still innocent and cute kids. Ah, the good old days as a father. This city was also abundant in nature energy, or whatever it is called in this world. Mana, you're right. This city has a significant amount of mana. It is not as rich as MT. Myoboku, Richie Cave, or Shikatsu Forest, but it is adequate for a normal city. 
particularly in a few areas of the city, such as Ryudu Temple and Mount Enzo. However, there is also negative energy. And it was potent and strong. Almost like the chakra of Ribus, the zero-tailed leech. It was called the Dark Chakra because it was filled with hatred and dark emotions, and Naruto noticed it coming from Central Park. So that's Angra Mainyu's energy, isn't it? While not as potent as a Bijou's, it is darker. Hum. As one would expect from all the world evil. Naruto narrowed his eyes as he looked through his telescope at the Dark Park. He just arrived with his master this morning. His master is undoubtedly an interesting individual. No, interesting wouldn't be the right word, but, unique one. Naruto thought as he nodded. If he recalls correctly, his master came from a normal Magus family. And his master was taken aback when she appeared with the command spells in her hand. She is. Both innocent and a monster. As emperor, Naruto has seen many people and the various types of evil that exist. His master is a villain. But she isn't either. She's an innocent monster, if you will. While she can show genuine kindness and cuteness, she can also rip apart your heart with an angelic smile if she so desires. Insane. Unsuspecting insane woman. It was more to the point than the innocent monster. He remembered how, the moment his blue eyes met hers, he knew what kind of person she is, and she also knew Naruto knew the real her. Era, perhaps? Is there someone in that tall building? Naruto's telescope unexpectedly captured a girl with twin-tail raven hair wearing a red long-sleeves dress, and on her side is a man with white spiky hair and tan skin, wearing a red coat and black armor. No one wears armor in this city, not even her servant. He quickly activated his presence concealment and concealed himself while observing the servant. They appear to be on patrol right now, looking for good places to fight. Is he going to confront them today? Hum. Naw. Nah. Naruto laughed, after all, this is war, and I still want to enjoy this city. Why take it quickly? I still have a lot of things I want to do. As he stood up and cracked his neck, he shifted his telescope near him to another direction. He smiled as he noticed a blue-haired figure with a spear sitting in a nearby building. So why not? It was only a practice battle. See how a clone deals with one of these heroic spirits. He quickly closed his telescope and jumped away. Lancer was having a bad day. Absolutely not. He was overjoyed when he was summoned by his original master. Bazit understood how to communicate as well as his own personality. She wasn't a wimp. In contrast to his new master. He didn't care because he didn't have a wish for the grail. He does, however, desire a good fight. And he can't have that fight because of his new master. Instead of fighting, his master instructs him to scout and not fight at full strength. When he remembered his time with Bazit, he gritted his teeth and tightened his grip on his spear. He despises Kirei Kotamine a lot. Era, you exude such murderous intent. Lancer's eyes widened in surprise when he heard a strange voice. He wasn't even aware of his presence. He quickly turned around to see a man leaned against the wall with his arms crossed. He's a young man. Perhaps around twenty. He has spiky blonde hair with bangs that reach both sides of his face, cerulean blue eyes, but... Do those look like whisker marks on his face? Lancer questioned himself with a blink as he noticed the marks on the man's face. He was dressed in a high-collared orange cape with black flames, with a long-sleeves black jacket underneath. He was also dressed in white long pants and black shoes, with something latched on the right leg of his pants. Lancer drew his spear and took a fighting stance. This man recognizes himself as a servant. But he had never felt his presence before. What is your name? Lancer inquired. When Naruto saw Lancer smirking, he slowly straightened his posture and said, Servant assassin, at your service. Lancer. Naruto paused and looked at his spear. Naruto concluded with a sly grin. Assassin. 
That explains why I didn't recognize you. Lancer murmured before giving Naruto a glum expression. What type of assassin dresses in orange? He made a deadpan. What kind of hero dresses in spandex? Naruto returned with a deadpan. Hey. This is called armor. You can't see it? It's also adaptable. Lancer defended himself by stretching his hand to show it, then pointing accusingly at Naruto with his finger. You're even odder. The Servant of Shadows is supposed to be an assassin. What kind of assassin dresses in bright colors? The very best. If only I could hide myself in this outfit. Imagine if I wore a black one. Naruto proudly puffed his chest and smiled. Lancer opened his mouth again, but closed it when he realized it was a valid and compelling argument. Let's just cut the chit-chat, shall we? He grumbled before glaring at Naruto. Naruto only smiled at Lancer and pulled two kanai from his pocket, saying, Indeed. Let's. They both stared at each other before moving. They were circling each other and studying their posture. Red and blue eyes met. Eventually, Naruto broke off first, throwing a kanai enhanced by wind chakra to Lancer. Lancer swiped away the kanai before moving his spear and blocking Naruto's slash. Naruto drew another kanai from his belt before twisting his body and delivering a horizontal slash. Lancer drew his face back, avoiding the slash, before spinning his spear and pushing Naruto away. He moved his leg before leaping at Naruto and launching a barrage of stab attacks at his head. Naruto straightened his leg and used his two kanai to deflect the numerous attacks. He swiped his body and delivered a heel kick, which Lancer blocked with the pommel of his spear before pushing Naruto away and slashing him. Naruto dodged the slash before twirling the kanai in his hand and unleashing an uppercut slash on Lancer. Lancer leaned back and jumped back, a grin on his face before his eyes widened when a cut appeared on his cheek. W what? Lancer pressed his cheek against Naruto's grin. He then noticed Naruto's kanai had a white invisible aura around it, as if it were covered by Wind? Did you notice it? One of my abilities is to channel my chakra I mean prana into my weapon and lengthen it. Naruto explained as he twirled the kanai in his hand and gripped it in the opposite direction. The next time, it'll sever your head. Lancer prepared himself as he took another stance. This man is excellent. That ability is both very good and clearly dangerous. How far can his kanai be stretched? Does it qualify as a noble phantasm? If he makes a minor error, that kanai will sever his head. Well. He's not too bad. He's fast, not as fast as me at full speed, but his skill is unrivaled. He is very skilled, whoever he is. At least this day wasn't completely dull. Lancer smiled as he thought. True, he couldn't go all out because his master had compressed his power with that command seal, but this man in front of him is no slouch. He's great. In fact, it was unusual to meet a spear wielder in my world. Well, that doesn't mean I've never fought with a long-ranged weapon or technique before. Naruto thought as he stared at Lancer. Lancer smiled as he heard the remark. This man was entertaining. Of course, assassin, he said as he prepared his spear, emphasizing the word, assassin. Naruto, who understood what Lancer was saying, noticed that Lancer was lying. He wasn't surprised. A man like Lancer can tell when someone is lying after clashing blades with him. Naruto dashed forward, both kanai in hand, without another word, and Lancer did the same. Clang! Clang, clang. Clang, clang. G-A-A-K-I-N. They engaged in melee combat once more, but this time Lancer went offensive, increasing his speed and displaying his superior spear skill. Meanwhile, Naruto avoided or parried all of the attacks. He realized that if he hadn't enchanted his weapons with chakra, the Lancer spear would break. His weapons aren't noble phantasms, but if he uses chakra manipulation on them, they become D or C level noble phantasms, depending on the weapon. 
The better the material, the better the weapon. Naruto jumped and dodged Lancer's slashes before spinning his body and delivering a kunai slash. Lancer moved his spear's pommel and blocked the attack before delivering a vertical slash to Naruto in the air. Naruto moved his other kunai and parried the attack before crouching and kicking the ground. Lancer spun his spear and blocked Naruto's slash. He had already destroyed Naruto's weapon several times, but the self-proclaimed assassin summoned another kunai and transformed them into another weapon, much to his chagrin. He stabs Naruto, but the shinobi avoids it by kicking the other side of the spear and using it as footing to deliver a heel kick. Lancer draws his body back before twisting his body and performing a spinning slash. Lancer grinned as his attack reached Naruto, but his eyes widened as Naruto, poofed, into a kunai. When he felt a presence behind him, he spun his body quickly, raising his spear to see Naruto in front of him, gripping the kunai enhanced by wind chakra and delivering a powerful double axe slash. G-A-A-A-A-K-I-N Their weapons collided and were equal, but Naruto wouldn't have it. He forced Chakra into his hand and pushed Lancer away with a roar, the spearman being blown away by his strength and crashing into a building several meters behind him. Naruto landed on the ground, a stern expression on his face, staring where Lancer had been blown away. He twirls his kunai before raising them and slashing the incoming construction material that has been knocked away. Lancer emerges from the building unharmed, raising his spear and smiling at Naruto indicating that his attack did not cause him much harm. Naruto, who was watching this, gave him a smirk before lowering his weapon, which confused Lancer. You're holding back. Why? He asked, his eyes narrowed. Lancer was taken aback when he heard this in response to his question. He let out a slow chuckle. You noticed it, didn't you? Good for you, I don't want to, but thanks to my stupid master, I've become weaker. As he remembered his order, he sighed. I see you have issues with your master. Naruto nodded, clearly understanding. After all, he had a problem with his master. Do you have the same one? Lancer inquired. Well, I have a minor issue with mine, but it hasn't hampered me in battle. Well, if you can't go all out now, then there's no point in fighting, Naruto replied waving his hand dismissively. With a sigh, he stated. Well, you could say that's correct. Lancer nodded in agreement. He cannot defeat him because the command spell prevents him from doing so. Are you willing to go all in in the next battle? Naruto inquired. Lancer, who was listening, blinked before making a thoughtful face. Well, he did tell me not to defeat anyone but only in the first meeting. A grin appeared on his face, and he nodded again to Naruto, indicating his response. Naruto grinned back at him, satisfied with the answer, Great, you are a skilled warrior, it would be a shame to kill you in this state. He said this as he turned to leave. Lancer called out to him, Wait. As he was about to leave, Naruto turns around to face him. Are you the real assassin? With his eyes narrowed, he inquired. He simply cannot believe this person is an assassin. While he did have presence concealment and his weapons were similar to one, his aura. His aura is not that of a typical assassin. And his eyes aren't those of a man fighting in the shadows. Yes, there's a hint of a man fighting in the shadows, but these are also the eyes of a warrior, and more importantly, a leader. Not to mention his fighting style. True, he fought like an assassin, using agility and the element of surprise, but he also fought with the bravery of a warrior. He then noticed the kanji for emperor, on the back of his coat for the first time, causing his eyes to widen slightly. Is it possible that he was an assassin before becoming emperor? But that was absurd. He'd never heard of a heroic spirit who was an assassin before ascending to the throne. When Naruto saw Lancer, he simply smirked over his shoulder and said, You saw my fight and my skill, if I'm not an assassin, what servant am I? As he stated, and, for the record, I was also holding back a lot. The real me runs his own company. 
Before Lancer could ask what he meant, Naruto burst into white smoke, making Lancer gawk. Did he go up against a clone? Or perhaps a shadow? Now that he has explained and demonstrated his assassin abilities, it is clear that he is an assassin. He was silent for a moment before breaking into a grin and laughing with his head thrown back. That skilled assassin, but he fights with honor and bravery. How many people are like that? He was clearly intriguing. He calmed himself after a moment and sighed, his grin still on his face. Perhaps this war won't be as bad as I thought. Lancer had a hopeful thought in his head. He had no idea he'd run into a second assassin today, which would leave him befuddled. Together with Kirei. Kirei had a thoughtful expression on her face as she heard and saw what Lancer did. This assassin was clearly special. Instead of Hassan Isaba, another assassin was summoned, indicating that this one is a false assassin. But how did this one come to be? Is there something bothering you, Kirei? A proud and arrogant voice inquired. Kirei turned to the source of the voice, his eyes blank and emotionless. Not too much, my king. It's just about the strange assassin who was summoned, Kirei explained. Hearing this, Gilgamesh furrowed his brow, oh? How about the worm? He inquired. He's interesting. He exhibited unique abilities, and it appears he was an emperor during his life. I'm just curious how an assassin became emperor during his life. Gilgamesh sneered as Kirei responded. That worm proclaiming himself emperor? Not only did he pretend to be king, but he also dared to taint such a title with his low class? Truly a haughty worm. Perhaps I should visit this worm and exterminate him now, Gilgamesh said, disgusted. I don't mean to diminish your role as king. But because the war has only just begun, we don't know whether the saber class will be summoned or not. Not to mention, isn't it your responsibility to exterminate assassin? Kire inquired because he did not want Gilgamesh to reveal himself too soon during the war. When Gilgamesh heard that, he began to think about it. True, killing a worm like assassin is not a job fit for a king, as Kire stated. I suppose you have a point. Yes, I'll let the dog get rid of this worm. After all, a king should not taint his hand by coming into contact with worms. Gilgamesh agreed before his eyes narrowed. And do you have any information about this saver class? No. The master of the servant has not yet arrived at the church. HMPH. I've waited ten years, and if my saber isn't summoned because of this saver class, I'll make sure this servant suffers, and this war won't last even two days because I'll be the one cleaning up after all those mongrels. Gilgamesh said in a gloomy tone. As you wish. Kire simply replied with a polite bow. Meanwhile, continue with the original Naruto. Naruto blinked as he remembered one of his clones. He appears to have only met one servant and was at least capable of matching the servant despite both of them holding back. He grinned and grunted, pleased that his clone was capable of going toe-to-toe -to -toe with a servant, even if only for a brief moment. All he had to do now was wait for all servants to be summoned. As far as he was aware, the real assassin, Castor, and Lancer had already been summoned. There was also that red-coated servant, whose class appears to be Archer based on his observation of the city from that tall building. Plus him, it would be six classes. According to his information, there should be seven servants, but it appears that there will be an extra as a result of him. It implies that there are two unidentified servants. Naruto. A cheerful voice interrupted his thoughts, and he saw his master emerge from her room, wearing her angelic smile. Are you sure, Haim? Naruto inquired. I'm just about to finish this story. Naruto is shown her book by his master. It was called, The Tale of the Utterly Gutsy Shinobi. Oh? You've already finished it? That was fast. Naruto commented, slightly surprised. That book was quite thick, so he was surprised to see his master finish it in a matter of days. She only laughed at Naruto's response before assuming a dreamy expression, 
it was an interesting story. I've never read anything like this before. And to think its main character is named after you. While the book is quite foolish, the journey and the quote are fantastic. Naruto laughed as she fawned like some fangirl. Hey. In my defense, I never requested that my name be named after that main character. Though I eventually found peace in my world, you could say my story is a continuation of that book. Naruto's response caused his master to blink. Really? Would you then tell me your story? Why not create a sequel? With a slight pout on her lips, she inquired. I'm terrible at writing him. I don't have the talent like my godfather. Sighed Naruto. Fine. Despite the fact that her voice was irritated, she said, when can I see Naruto perform? I want to see you battle all of the servants. I'm sure you're stronger than them. Haim, just be patient. We need more information about our enemy, Naruto replied, after all servants are summoned and I see their skills, we will strike, a good emperor always acts cautiously. He gave a speech. I understand. But I simply cannot wait. I'm hoping that all servants will be summoned soon, she smiled as she accepted Naruto's response. Well. Naruto leaned back in a comfortable manner, tell me what you want to do now. You're bored, and so am I. Are you killing people? Haim, I'm an emperor, but I don't murder people for fun. I only kill when absolutely necessary. Fine. What about the bad guys? That is tolerable but only if their crime is severe, such as rape or slavery. When his master let out a squeal, Naruto had to hold his ears back so they didn't pop. Being summoned by someone like his master was a strange experience. Oh well, at the very least, he could prevent her from becoming a psychopath and guide her down the right path by utilizing her monster nature. After all, he was a servant saver, and saving people, especially his master, was his job in this class. The moment Naruto was summoned. Manaka Sajiu is a lovely young lady. She is always gentle, mature, and kind to everyone. She also frequently assists her parents, studies their magecraft, and has advanced it to a higher level. Her advancement in magecraft surpasses that of the Seiju family's head. You could say she is a gift from heaven, and her father will no doubt ensure that one day, under Manaka's guidance, the Seiju family will surpass the three great families such as Tasaka, Matu, and Einsburn. Her father is proud of her, and she can tell when his eyes meet hers. Love and deep admiration. She also looked after her younger sister like the big sister she is, despite the fact that her younger sister is a little meek and timid. She is aware that her sister developed an inferiority complex because of her, and she tried to help her, but it didn't help much. She is also one of her school's role models. She is smart, beautiful, cute, kind, caring, and gentle. Her innocent and angelic smile even cheered up the few people who were down. She is everything a magus could want in an heir. Manaka, on the other hand, is dissatisfied. Despite all of her respect, prizes, rewards, praise, love, and successes, she is still unhappy. Don't get me wrong she's content. She is pleased when she is praised and respected, but only at first. She became bored with being praised after a few times. Yes, she realized what she did was wonderful and extremely beneficial to her family, but it was not beneficial to her. What good is all her magecraft if it can't be used for something? And what was the point of fame and respect if it only made her life more boring? No, none of her claimed accomplishments could bring her joy. She desired to discover something she had never discovered. She wishes to see things she has never seen before. She wants to see the unnatural expression on people's faces when they see her. As in killing people. She never did anything like that. True, she had a pet rabbit before, but she loved it and it enjoyed her company. One month later, with her usual angelic smile, she nailed it. She's not sure how, but she could sense the rabbit's betrayal, and to be honest, seeing that expression was interesting. She wondered what their reactions would be if she started killing people. 
In another world, another universe, Manaka Sajiu would leave her path and follow the path of destruction. It was because she had a connection to the root from the beginning and knew what it was like, so it would be boring and she wished to see something else. She desired to see her wish fulfilled through destruction. But not in this case. She didn't get connected to the root here. So she did find the root, which she was hoping to see. But getting there isn't easy. The only reason she maintained her mask was because she wished to reach the root. She's curious about what it is and how it grants wishes. So it was a complete surprise when a command spell appeared on her hand. She had never heard of anything like this before, so she asked her father about it. Manaka had to resist the urge to rip her father apart after hearing the explanation. Her father never told her about the Holy Grail because it happened when she was a still child and ended in disaster, and it also won't happen for another 60 years, so he thought it wouldn't matter. She was certain she knew everything there was to know about magic, first magic, second magic, third magic, fourth magic, and fifth magic. But she had no idea the Holy Grail possessed the third magic because her father had never explained it to her. Manaka jumped for joy after hearing the explanation. Using a heroic spirit as a servant? That was fantastic. Who wouldn't want that? She would also be able to see the root with the Holy Grail. She wasn't interested in how it granted wishes, but she was intrigued by its appearance. She immediately began her search for a suitable hero. They had no trouble obtaining a catalyst to summon a hero thanks to her developed magic. However, she did not do so. Why? It was because she wanted to put her luck to the test. She was curious about the type of servant who would come for someone like her. Why did the Grail choose her? She had no idea, in fact, she had no idea about it until her father explained it to her. That's why she wanted to put her luck to the test. If Grail chooses her as a master, what servant would she gain solely through her luck? That was fascinating. Her father actually forbade her from doing so, stating that he wanted her to summon the best hero to win the Grail. But she was adamant. She wants to see her path, and her father reluctantly agreed after a few conversations and convincing. And now we find her standing in the magical circle her father has created. Her father stood behind her in her workshop. She began to chant the words to summon a servant while channeling prana throughout her entire body, and all of her magic circuit within her body flared, summoning an existence known as heroic spirit. She wished to try her luck and see which servant she would receive, but the core of the grail decided for her. She referred to her as champion. Flash. A bright light appears and fills the entire room. Manaka and her father had to cover their faces due to the smoke and wind that appeared and blew everything away. A shadowy figure appears out of nowhere, placing one foot on the ground before standing firm. A man stood in front of Manaka and her father. He stands six feet tall and wears a triangular hat with a veil covering his back and sides. Manaka noted that the hat was orange in color and had a black kanji that said, Emperor. He was dressed in a short-sleeved, orange high-collared cape with black flames, a black long-sleeved jacket, white pants and shoes, and something latched on his right leg. Manaka and her father held their breath as her servant raised his hand, placed it on his hat, and raised it slightly, allowing them to see his face. He was a handsome man around the age of 20, with bright blue cerulean eyes similar to Manaka's, spiky blonde hair with bangs reaching each side of his face. He also possessed. Do those look like whisker marks on his face? With a blink, Manaka considered something. The man gave them a brief look before grinning. I'm Naruto Uzumaki, God's Conqueror, Emperor of Shinobi and Samurai. Which of you invited me? Datbeo. Hakuno Seiju, Manaka's father, was taken aback. What kind of servant starts with his name instead of his class? And who on earth is Naruto Uzumaki? He had never heard of this name before, but more importantly. Datbeo? With a sweat drop on his brow, he pondered. What exactly is that? Is there a verbal tick? 
What a strange servant she summoned. Manaka was unconcerned by Naruto's declaration, instead taking a step forward and raising her arm. I'm Naruto Uzumaki, your master. She said it in a sing-song tone. Manaka noticed Naruto turn to face her, and their gazes locked. Then she froze when she saw his blue eyes. True, their colors were nearly identical to hers, but... These eyes. She can feel it. Naruto's eyes pierced very deep into her soul, and she could feel Naruto's eyes stripping her mask naked and passing through to her true self. This servant. Wasn't your average servant. He recognizes her and notices her mask. She awoke from her trance when she heard her servant summon her. So I was summoned by a lovely and adorable lady. Lady, may I ask what your name is? He inquired politely. Manaka smiled again and rose her skirt in a ladylike manner, giving Naruto a slight bow. My name is Manaka Sajiu, and it's a pleasure to meet you, Naruto Uzumaki. Naruto gave her a brief nod, indicating that he was pleased with the introduction. That means you're the one who called me in. So, first we'll get to know each other, and then we'll talk about the impending war. He pushed his hat to the back of his neck, allowing it to hang down to his backhead and reveal his blonde hair. Nice to meet you, Manaka-chan. He said to her with a smile. Manaka locked her gaze on her servant. He was truly intriguing, and she could tell he was sincere. Even after witnessing her true self, her desire to harm others, this man does not appear to be bothered by her. Normal people would be bothered or even terrified if they saw her true nature. However, this man. Not even frightened or disgusted. A typical one. Interesting. Excuse me, Naruto-san, but what class do you belong to? For the first time since the summoning, Hakuno, her father, spoke. Naruto turned to the man with a thoughtful expression, I actually can be summoned as one of the seven main classes, as well as one of the three extra classes, but... This time I got summoned as saver. To Hakuno's surprise, he responded. A servant who could be summoned into all classes. That's not the kind of servant I'm looking for. He'd never heard of such a valiant spirit. And what's the deal with the saver class? He has never heard of it before. He could tell his daughter was surprised as well. Saver? Manaka inquired. True, saver. You could argue that it's a class for saviors of the worlds or messiahs, but don't ask me why I was summoned in that class. You were the one who performed the summoning chant. Naruto responded with a shrug. But we summoned saber using the chant. Hakuno frowned in response. Then your fortune is rotten. Naruto stated flatly, much to Hakuno's chagrin, as his direct response irritated him, why don't we just take it somewhere else? It's pretty crammed in here. Later, in the Manaka room. You know who I am, Manaka said flatly. Naruto, who was dressed in a white, gray plain t-shirt, a bright orange hooded jacket, and long blue pants, sipped his drink calmly. Naruto and Manaka spend time together to get to know each other after a brief explanation about saver class and an interrogation from Manaka's father about who or what Naruto was. Actually, Hakuno disliked Naruto. He was a mystery. When he asked who Naruto was and what his story was, Naruto simply told him that he wouldn't be able to find a story about him anywhere because it was a fairy tale. It was pointless for Hakuno to look for a story or biography about Naruto. Hakuno didn't take it well. He couldn't leave his daughter with someone as mysterious as Naruto. It was no secret to him that servants could kill their master or only use them as a prana battery. So, while Hakuno was looking for Naruto's story, he gave Naruto and Manaka some time to get to know each other. Yes, I know. Naruto said dismissively to Manaka, as if it were nothing out of the ordinary. And you're not bothered at all? Not even a little disgusted? Why? Manaka inquired, his head cocked. Manaka-chan, I've seen worse. Naruto chuckled. Do you believe I became emperor simply because I was bestowed with the title? 
For my title, I fought and struggled. Faced with an enemy you've never seen or fought before, I have basic knowledge of this world and I must say it's still rather peaceful to me. Naruto laughed, and it's true. His worlds are crueler than ours. Although there are no vampires in his world, the humans are far more vicious and cruel. They never stop fighting. Children are sent to fight, even if they are not yet of fighting age. Forced to witness the horrors of war. The terror of seeing a friend beheaded like an insect. Then they are forced to watch as their friends are experimented on, captured, and turned into slaves or breeding stock. And the majority of them aren't even older than Manaka. The majority of them are only 11 or 12, or even worse, 8 or 6. They lacked the advanced technology that we have, which is why they are more brutal and their methods are more vicious and cruel. Really? So you've met someone like me before? Manaka inquired, surprised. Naruto took a breather while raising his cup. He looks Manaka in the eyes for a moment before smiling bitterly and setting his cup down. You have envy. Naruto stated, ignoring Manaka's question, which caused her to blink. You are far too perfect. You get everything you desire until you become bored. When you see ordinary people, you envy them. You may not admit it, but you are envious. Hearing that made Manaka feel slapped. Her bright eyes had turned cold, and her angelic smile had vanished, replaced by anger and a cold expression. How do you know this? She muttered something coldly. What Naruto said hit her right in the gut. Despite her dismissive attitude toward the world and desire to find interesting things to entertain herself, she is jealous on the inside. She is envious of people who can show genuine kindness and gentle manners. Not like her disguise. Naruto was unconcerned by Manaka's cold expression, instead flashing her a smile, because I had a pal. To me, he was like a brother. We had similar lives and histories. But, in the end, we took different roads. As a result, he became envious of me. He was envious because I had grown stronger and he felt like he was always following me from behind. Hearing Naruto's words, Manaka's eyes narrowed slightly. She didn't understand how what he said related to her. I'm not sure how it relates to me. Manaka spoke up. My friend, you see, is similar to you. Everything was handed to him. He was perfect, just like you, and everyone adored him. But he didn't return it because he was focused on his goal. In contrast to your desire for something interesting, his goal was vengeance. Naruto continued as he looked her in the eyes, short story, he obtained his vengeance, but it was ultimately futile. He began to blame everyone except himself because he envied them, people who laughed normally and were happy. He paused and gave Manaka a bitter smile. You, Manaka-chan, are similar to him. True, you have different objectives and desires, but I can see it in you. You're on the same path as he is. After you kill one person, I'm sure you'll kill more until you're beyond saving. Hearing Naruto, Manaka's expression became neutral. Her blue eyes were closed and she spoke slowly, what makes you think I care about that? She posed a challenging question. Because you're still envious. Naruto responded simply, you're envious of them, and you know deep down that what you're about to do is wrong. That demonstrates that you still have morals. He gave her a small smile, and that's a good thing because it shows you're still alive. You may be a monster, but you still have limits. Manaka, who was listening, had wide eyes for the first time after being angry at Naruto mentioning her jealousy. Is it possible? Could I really realize what I did was wrong? No. I know it's wrong to be curious about how I'll react if I kill people, but it's the only thing I find amusing in this world. To discover something new. Manaka pondered with a blank expression on her face. When Naruto noticed her discomfort, he slowly stood up and patted her on the head, surprising her. There's no need to be so pessimistic. We can kill someone in the war if you really want to. Manaka smiled inwardly, but she couldn't hide the surprised look on her face. But, 
don't you hate killing? I don't despise killing. After all, I'm emperor for a reason. Naruto snorted in response, we'll try to satiate your hunger by murdering some people. You want to see it with your own eyes, right? Then that's fine. People will die in this war. You can use it as a disguise to avoid being pursued by the Magus Association. But, why? Why do you want to assist me? Manaka inquired. Because. Naruto smiled and knelt down to her height, who am I to stop you from finding something interesting? All I need to do is point you in the right direction. Servant Saver is my name. My summoner must be saved before anyone else. He finished with a friendly smile. And with that, a beautiful and angelic smile gradually appeared on Manaka's face. A happy smile because someone accepts her. Someone who recognizes her for who she is rather than what she has done. Someone willing to accompany her and guide her on her journey. Even if her path is incorrect, this man will still follow it. Normally, if someone said something like that to Manaka, she would kill him, her before turning away, unconcerned by their words. However, Naruto. Somehow, something about Naruto made her believe in him when he spoke like that. It was as if she were standing in front of the world's savior, a man capable of saving even a serial killer. You must thank A++ Charisma for this. Saver. It appears that your class is a good fit for you, she thought with an inward chuckle. Thank you very much, Naruto. Naruto only grunted in response before standing up and drinking the tea that had been served to him. Say. Naruto, you know a lot about me, but I know nothing about you. Could you tell me something about your time period? Manaka inquired, intrigued. Naruto came to a halt in the middle of his drink before finishing it and setting his the down. He paused for a moment before grinning and biting his thumb, drawing blood and performing hand seals before slamming it down on the table. Kuchios. Summoning. Manaka was taken aback when white smoke appeared on Naruto's palm, which was resting on the table. In the smoke was a scroll resembling one from the feudal era. As Naruto opened the scroll, Manaka noticed strange symbols. Naruto then places a hand on the middle symbol, similar to runecraft but different. Poof. Manaka blinked as a single book appeared on it. Naruto took the book, rolled up the scroll, and handed it to Manaka. The story of the extremely brave shinobi? As she took the book, Manaka read the title with a puzzled expression. Before I explain my life, you should know what era I lived in. My godfather wrote that book during his journey. First, read it, and then I'll tell you about myself. With a grin, Naruto suggested. One day after the fight with Lancer, Naruto is present. 12.37 PM. Naruto was standing in an alleyway, looking thoughtful. He came alone with her master. It was difficult to persuade Manaka's father not to accompany her. Naruto didn't need Hakuno to accompany them because he would jeopardize his plan to destroy the Grail. If Naruto told Hakuno about his goal, Hakuno would immediately contact the Magus Association, drawing too much attention to himself. Naruto didn't want to create unnecessary chaos. Naruto was confident that Manaka would not mind if he destroyed the Grail. The little girl had no idea it existed in the first place, so it was fine if it was destroyed. Manaka had to persuade her father that she wanted to experience the war alone and see how real fights are so she could understand Magus' life and blah, blah, blah. Fortunately, it was a success. Back on topic, Naruto was thinking about his situation as a heroic spirit right now. The problem is that Naruto had no idea what a hero was. He lacked detailed information. For example, in the story about Lu Biyu, he only knew that Lu Biyu was a general in his previous life but lacked information about his abilities. This is due to the fact that the throne of hero he entered was not the entire throne of hero. He did not properly enter the throne. He didn't know anything except the fundamentals of this world, such as magus, mana, odd, technology, and so on. 
it was more like the hero's throne wasn't finished processing his life. The program is still not finished. There was no copy of him, and the throne couldn't download his entire life because he entered in a unique way, and his bond with Rakud's chakra as well as the pure world of his world also affected the throne. As a result, he didn't know much about heroes like King Arthur or Cao Cao. He had no idea why King Arthur had fallen or what his weapon was. He was basically screwed. He knew nothing about his opponents except that Lancer used a lance, Archer used long-ranged weaponry, Saber used a sword, Berserker was a mad servant, and so on. But there was at least one bright spot. His adversary will not know anything about him either. No, they will recognize Naruto. He was emperor in life, they'd know Naruto was an assassin, they'd know Naruto was an orphan with a bad childhood, but that's it. They won't be aware of his abilities. Apart from the fact that he was a ninja, of course. There's no need to think about such things. I need to gather more information right now. Caster and assassin are in Ryudu temple. Archer is with that twin-tailed girl who is the Tasaka heiress thanks to the information of Manaka father. Chan's lancer always scouts the city. Ryder was still a mystery since I haven't met her yet. Same with Berserker and Saber is still unknown. While rubbing his chin, Naruto reflected. Naruto. 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 Naruto turned around to face his master. She had pale skin like Sasuke, neck-length light blonde hair like Ino, and bright blue eyes like Sasuke. She was dressed in a light blue gown that exposed her shoulders and back. Her dress has a short skirt that ends a few centimeters below her hips. She also wore gloves to conceal her command seals. She was also covered in blood. Are you finished, Manaka-chan? Naruto inquired, a bitter smile on his face. Of course, Naruto let Manaka go free to kill people. But the people Manaka killed were not ordinary people, but criminals. Like rapists and also some who sell narcotics to teenagers. Scum. Naruto didn't mind killing people in this manner. Rapists will be tortured until they die in his kingdom. Slavers will be turned into slaves twice as many times as their victims. Aha! Uh -huh. Manaka responded with a big childlike smile. I'm finished. Why didn't you kill any of them? I wanted to see how you kill people. She pouted. Manaka-chan, my method of killing is straightforward. Stab them in the head with a kanai and they're dead, Naruto deadpanned, I don't think that's very special. Then use a unique one. Manaka said in a childish tone before turning and pointing to one of her victims who was still breathing on the ground, I even left one for you. No, Naruto replied. Please? I'm interested in seeing your ninjutsu. Only once. Naruto's eyes twitched as Manaka begged with a cute face. All right, all right. Manaka smiled as Naruto surrendered. He takes a step forward and performs a one-handed seal. Sorry, nothing personal, but you must pay for your crimes. How many women have you raped? Four? That's a death penalty for you. Fire release. Grand fireball technique. Kaden. Gukakyu no jutsu. Naruto hurled a 2M blazing ball of fire at the rapist and his companion. He appears to have retained his five-element nature, though he preferred to use wind, but hey. Flames are also cool. The flame engulfed the thug before he could respond. He screamed in agony as he felt the hot flame blaze and burn him like paper, pleading for help, but Manaka had already set up a boundary field that prevented anyone from hearing their sounds. Naruto turned to Manaka, who had starry eyes, after the flame turned the group to ash and blew them away with a simple windjutsu. You spit flames out of your mouth. She said this with awe. You're a magus, correct? Isn't this typical of you? Naruto inquired, perplexed. I've never seen a human spew flames before. That was unusual. I'd never heard of a magus doing that. Manaka responded with a laugh. When Naruto heard that, he simply rolled his eyes and smiled. 
Now that you've finished killing, how did it feel? Asked his master. He inquired. Manaka paused her giggling and thought for a moment before smiling like an angel. It was an enjoyable experience. I felt their blood on my hand after seeing them beg for their lives. When I saw them. I'd never seen anything like it before, so it was really interesting, and I also enjoy it when they scream. In addition to being a psycho, she is a sadist. Great. Fortunately, his master was still capable of being saved. Coming from someone of your caliber, I'm not surprised. Let's go before anyone notices this boundary thing, right? You can get rid of the bloodstains, right? Naruto inquired, and Manaka smiled and nodded. It took about one minute to clean up the mess and bloodstains. Both then exited the alleyway and walked away. It's still noon, and killing people quietly is easy for Naruto, even at noon. He may not enjoy being sneaky and stealthy, but he can pull it off when necessary. When he's doing that, he's also pretty good. And kidnapping a rapist in the shadows only made his job easier. Naruto entered his astral form and activated presence concealment once more as they exited the alleyway. Naruto walked through the city, staring out the window and humming inwardly. Seeing the town up close was preferable to using his clones. This epic is fascinating. While the medical was still better in mine, the buildings and technology were a different story, Naruto said to his master via his mental link. Even if the grail does provide you with remedial knowledge of the modern era, seeing it with your own eyes must be fascinating. Manaka nodded as she saw the city and agreed to her servant. It's not as large as my city, but it's fine on its own. However, I must say, with your medical knowledge, was your era better than now? Naruto was a mystery to Manaka. While she didn't agree with his wishes, she was intrigued by his background. According to what she read in, Tale of the Utterly Gutsy Shinobi, they are in the middle of the feudal era, or possibly earlier. The era was clearly brutal, and it could have been before the start of the First World War, or it could have been during the Age of Gods. However, he is not historically significant. Naruto Uzumaki has no history, and her father can't find anything about him. It's as if, as Naruto mentioned, his story is a fairy tale. So, for Manaka, Naruto is a complete puzzle that piques her interest. He was not only the one who would lead her, but also one of the mysteries she wished to unravel. And it didn't hurt that he was handsome and cute with those whisker marks. He looked like a prince. No way, emperor. Yes, he's more like an emperor who guides than a knight in shining armor. It's clearly superior to a knight. Hum. My time, eh? You could argue that yours and mine have the same level of medical knowledge. Though, in combat, I believe my era will triumph because it was more brutal than yours. Of course, no offense. With a chuckle, Naruto stated. None taken. Manaka responded with a chuckle. After that, the master and servant pair fell silent, content with each other's company and the peaceful surroundings. Manaka continued to bask in her hero's presence while walking and enjoying the city, while Naruto reflected on his own thoughts about the servants and the war. Naruto decided to break the silence a few minutes later. Hum. I wonder what people think about this war, eh? thought Naruto. Hum? Are you interested in something like that? Manaka inquired, surprised. No, I am not. I don't care if one servant wishes to destroy the world. However, I am intrigued. Servants, as far as I know, are summoned by an artifact or item related to them. I was just wondering if there was some interesting wish. Manaka chuckled as Naruto mused. Measuring someone's wish will be difficult. After all, humanity is selfish and petty, Naruto. Humanity has been full of insignificant wishes throughout history, regardless of the person. It made no difference whether you were a king or a peasant. Everyone had at least one insignificant, selfish desire deep within them that they wished to be granted in some way. The grail came into being as a result of these wishes. 
it was created to fulfill the petty desires of the petty people who gave birth to it. If this is true, why shouldn't the Holy Grail be selfish and petty? Manaka's response caused Naruto to blink. That made him smile on the inside. He understood exactly what Manaka meant when he said that the Grail had its own will. Yes, he was aware of it. He even met with the core of the Grail and spoke with her. But he couldn't tell Manaka that. No, not yet. He also wanted to see how well Manaka understood humanity. He elaborated because it would help him guide Manaka. Oh? You mean the Grail has its own will? Naruto inquired, and Manaka responded with a nod. Yes. Even the Holy Grail has its own will. After all, it was created by people with a desire. I believe the Grail, like its creators, is selfish and petty. It was created to grant humanity's trivial wishes because it is incapable of doing anything else. Even if people are unaware of it, the Grail is aware of their deepest desire. It knows what humanity desires. That is what makes the Grail so intriguing. Manaka responded with a nod. And I believe the Grail heard my wish. She paused, looking at her right arm, which was covered by gloves. As you mentioned, deep down I want to find someone who understands me and accepts me for who I am, without trying to change me. Even my nature has been twisted, and the Grail has responded by summoning you. Manaka stated, and Naruto could see her beautiful smile. Hum. Despite your strange nature, you understand humanity quite well, as evidenced by the quote you showed Manaka-chan. In this peaceful era, you're already mature for your age. Naruto praised with sincerity, and Manaka smiled in response. Will you do it again and change my name to Haim? Manaka inquired, hopeful, and Naruto chuckled. You are mature for your age, Manaka Haim, even if in a peaceful era you already know humanity pretty well. As one would expect from a princess, Naruto said modestly, and Manaka let out a mental squeal. She enjoyed it when Naruto addressed her as princess. Nah, Naruto. May I inquire as to your wish? Manaka inquired, not because she cared, but because, like Naruto, she was curious. My wish, eh? I don't have one. Naruto responded, and it's true that even if the Grail wasn't corrupted, he wouldn't have one. After all, he was already content with his life. Naruto was here because of the Grail's will, as Manaka stated. The real Grail wishes to be cleansed of the anger Mainyu's stain, and she even begged Naruto to do so. He was only here to assist Emiya Kuritsugu and to assassinate Angra Mainyu. Justice shared his story with him. She didn't go into detail about the Fourth Holy Grail War, but she did tell him about Emiya Kuritsugu and his sacrifice to prevent the birth of all the evils of the world. He gave up his relationship with his daughter, divorced his wife, and allowed his partner to die. Everything for the sake of the world. Another Itachi Uchiha story. The man who murdered his family and shed his blood for the sake of the world. Even if he bears the world's evils as long as the world is at peace. That's why Naruto showed up. That is why he will murder Angra Mainyu. This thing even showed Kuritsugu his family's dream and forced him to kill them. There is no mercy. As soon as the grail was complete, the largest bijudama capable of destroying an island was launched at it. He'd annihilate this thing. He took the name Uzumaki Naruto and the title Emperor. Manaka, unaware of Naruto's thoughts and only hearing his response, blinked in surprise. Naruto lacked a wish? So, why was he called? Do you not have one? How about a good fight or seeing your family? Manaka inquired. Manaka Chan. I have no regrets in my life, nor do I have any wishes. I've already accomplished everything in my life, and as much as I enjoy fighting, I also enjoy peace." Naruto laughed, further perplexing Manaka. If Naruto doesn't have a wish, could the Grail have summoned Naruto for her? A one of a kind? It could be something like that. She smiled heartily at the thought. It meant Naruto was her destiny. 
While Naruto and Minaka were trapped in their own minds, they continued walking and got closer to Fuyuki City's local school. When they got close, they sensed something and came to a halt. When Naruto sensed something wrong with the school, his astral eyes narrowed, and Minaka approached the school gate, rubbing it slowly. This school, Minaka-chan. Yes. This school is surrounded by a boundary field. That means one of the masters is a student at this institution. And it's made to absorb souls from humans, whoever the servant did this has clearly overstepped their boundaries because they're involving innocent people, Minaka explained as they stared at the school. What is Castor's up to? No. Castor and Assassin are residents of Ryudu Temple. Naruto responded in a neutral tone. So it must be Ryder. Naruto blinked as Minaka concluded. What gives you that impression? Naruto inquired, perplexed. Archer, Lancer, and Saber would never do something like this. They are knight servants who fight with weapons, and it was unusual to see one of them use a boundary field like this. Berserker is obvious because the servant of madness is Castor a Rider. Castor is at Ryudu Temple, leaving only Rider. Naruto whistled as Minaka explained. That was an interesting deduction. He didn't know much about these Magus things because he didn't get all of the information. That's why he couldn't understand, but he was fortunate to have a master like Minaka who was an expert in magecraft. You're quite astute. Smart, beautiful, and lethal, you would have made an excellent Kunoichi, Minakaheim. Naruto praised Minaka for her big and beautiful smile. Many thanks, Naruto-kun. When he called her, Haim, again, she responded sincerely and with love, making Naruto chuckle. I'll send a clone to check on the school tonight. We might have to start acting tonight, Minaka-chan. Naruto said. All right. Hum. Since the Matu family bloodline is dying, it means the Tasaka heiress, after all, she is the city's second owner. Minaka spoke up, and Naruto nodded in his astral form. Is the Matu bloodline dying? Hum. I'll send a clone to check on them as well. Eh? Why? Minaka inquired, perplexed. Dying and being dead are not the same thing, Minaka-chan. Dying implies that you are still alive, albeit barely. Just in case. They could be Ryder's master. If you're going to murder someone, make sure you do it with your own eyes. Naruto delivered a speech. Facing a being like Orochimaru made him very cautious about killing people. Unless Naruto saw it with his own eyes, the enemy could still be alive. They will start their move tonight, possibly without fighting. But they'll be scouting openly now. There's no reason to hide any longer. Naruto was already aware that six servants other than himself had been summoned. He met with Assassin himself to put the man to the test, and he had already fought Lancer. That's more than enough, and if he's lucky, he'll see another pair of servants fighting each other to see who is the strongest. And knowing his luck, he was certain that a battle would take place tonight. Night. And once again, Naruto's luck was on his side as he stood on the Homurahara Academy field with Minaka by his side. They were now two kilometers away from the building, and while he didn't have the sharp eyes of the archer class, he could see that far thanks to Minaka's magic. Naruto and Minaka were able to see further than normal human eyes by using formal craft. While not as good as archer's keen eyesight, it was adequate for this distance. They were surprised to see Archer using swords instead of a bow and even dual wielding as they watched the intense battle between archers and lancers. A sword wielding bowman. Interesting. Naruto muttered something. The battle between archer and lancer could be described as a draw. At first, archer pushed lancer back, but lancer gradually began to push back, and now it was clear that the servant of the spear had gained an advantage over the servant of the bow. Archer's weapons broke many times, just like Naruto's, but Archer kept summoning another weapon, which broke. Naruto observed that Archer's weapon had already been destroyed or knocked off 27 times, but he kept summoning another one. 
Lancer then focused a great deal of power into his spear, indicating that he was about to use his noble phantasm. This is what he had been looking forward to. He was desperate to witness one of these noble phantasms in action. While Naruto concentrated on the battle and learned their strategy, Manaka's gaze was drawn elsewhere as she caught something. Oh, there are witnesses. Manaka mumbled. Naruto narrowed his eyes and followed Manaka's gaze. A red-haired adolescent stood back and watched the battle from a safe distance. There should be no witnesses to this war, according to the rules. They were either eliminated or had their memories erased because the boy had witnessed something he should not have. While he didn't like it, rules are rules, and if the secret of Magus' existence was revealed, there would be chaos. Would you like me to take him out? Naruto inquired. He may not be good at throwing from afar, but thanks to his servant abilities, he could undoubtedly hit the boy with a wind chakra enhanced kanai. Manaka was about to respond, yes, but she paused when she saw Lancer notice the boy's presence and the boy flee from him. Naruto also noticed this and promptly silenced himself while he continued to watch. They noticed Rin and Archer pursuing Lancer. It appears that Tasaka Eris wanted to save an innocent student. Given that she was the city's second owner, she was actually quite responsible. Unfortunately, they saw Lancer leave after a brief moment, which meant the boy was already dead because Rin and Archer had left not long after him, implying they were too late. Lancer has already dealt with that kid. Why don't we scout elsewhere? Manaka proposed. Where? Naruto inquired. It's a restaurant. Manaka smiled. It's just you and me. Naruto swore he saw sparkles in her eyes as she declared. That was another issue. Manaka appears to be becoming more clingy. It's almost as if the princesses are seeing their knight in shining armor. Let's at least follow Lancer. Naruto did a deadpan. Why? Manaka asked, pouting. Naruto was about to respond when he noticed Rin and Archer leaving the school. He noticed they didn't carry any bodies, which was unusual, and judging by Rin Tasaka's nature thus far, she wouldn't destroy the body, which means. Could she have healed the boy? But, if she didn't want him involved, why didn't she keep him under guard and explain everything? Lancer will most likely go after the boy again if he discovers that he is still alive. Naruto's pupils constricted. The little girl must not have been too sharp to miss such an obvious point. Anyway, that wasn't his problem. As much as he wanted to help the boy, it wasn't his responsibility. He had his own problem with the grail, and he was no longer the naive boy who wanted to help everyone. I suppose we can go eat for a moment. I'll send a clone to monitor the school. Naruto declared. Yay. Manaka chirped happily like a child who had received a gift, and Naruto smiled before grabbing Manaka in a bridal manner, causing the woman to let out a rare, eep. That. That was adorable. Naruto paused, blinking. He admits his master is cute and acts like an innocent child, and he might have been fooled if he hadn't seen her tear apart a rapist's heart with an angelic smile this afternoon. Manaka blushed as Naruto carried her, then grinned lightly before snuggling closer to his jacket. Why let this opportunity pass you by? Naruto just shook his head at his master's antics, but he could tell his master was becoming more intimate with him. He gave Rin and Archer one last look before leaping away with his master. Emiya residence after midnight. Shuru staggered home, relief washing over him in a cool wave as he closed the gate behind him. He tottered into his living room, barely remembering to turn on the lights before collapsing onto the floor, completely exhausted. He grimaced as he remembered being stabbed with a spear. I'm curious who saved me. If I ever meet them, I'd like to thank them. He mumbled, still barely aware of his surroundings as he considered his resurrection. As he sat against the wall, he let his mind wander, trying to figure out how he was still alive after being stabbed through the heart with a barbed spear. Even thinking about it reminded him of the sickening sensation of the spearhead in his chest. 
he could still feel the stab in his chest. Damn. I'll have nightmares about this for months. Shuru mumbled, what the hell happened back there? He wondered as his tired mind replayed the battle. Those two. They were attempting to kill each other. And the weapons. He didn't know how to put it, but those two fighters couldn't be human, and their weapons were anything but normal. None of his attempts to comprehend what he had witnessed could assuage his fears and confusion. The lights flickering off and the innocuous clattering of a strategically placed wooden bell in the ceiling blew those thoughts out of his head. That bell was inextricably linked to the boundary field his adoptive father had installed on the property. While it did nothing to deter intruders, it did alert him if anyone entered the grounds with malicious intent. His father was quite proud of the field, claiming that it was both accurate and subtle, and that removing it would require an extremely powerful magus with far too much time on their hands. After all, his father was Emiya Karitsugu, the magus killer, so setting up something like this isn't difficult, even if he was cursed, which Shuru was unaware of. He couldn't think of anyone who would be after him, except. Wait a minute, what did that spearman say? Sorry for the inconvenience, but rules are rules. Rest in peace, my friend. I saw something I shouldn't have and was killed because of it. Now that I'm alive. He was terrified and thought frantically. Shuru curled onto the balls of his feet, startled but unwilling to risk letting a sound escape his throat. He searched the room for a weapon for protection. Of course, he didn't have anything other than a metal tube lying around. The tube held a limited edition poster that Fuji Nei had brought here the day before. He discovered the hard way that the damn thing was solid metal. Right now, however, it would be ideal. Continue your journey. The self-suggestion allowed him to channel his magic through the item in his hands, he intoned. Analyze the basic structure. Reinforce basic quality. Trace. Removed. Shuru finished his spell and returned to full awareness. Even though he was proud of himself for casting the normally difficult spell, he couldn't think about it when an intruder was in his home. Shuru didn't have time to think about it further because a surge of murderous intent struck him, causing his spine to conveniently replace itself with an ice rod. He barely had time to react before throwing himself against the opposing wall and rolling to face his attacker. Blue armor, dark hair in a ponytail, crimson eyes, and a spear of the same color. Had his assassin already found him? Well, redhead, you've proven to be a whole new breed of pain in the ass. Never before had I had to kill a man twice in the same day. Lancer stated, his face bored. Now, do me a favor and stay still. It'll hurt less for you that way. He grunted and thrust his spear with lightning speed. Shuru took a rash gamble, wrapping his hand around the poster tube and swinging it with all his might, successfully parrying the crimson weapon. Huh? The attacker questioned his improvised weapon before smiling with a feral gleam in his eyes. Oh, you've got an interesting trick there, kid. Is it correct that you appear to be a magus? Despite the cold realization that he had no chance against this guy without some serious divine intervention, the red-headed magus in training kept his cool. He desperately needed a miracle right now. Looks like I'll have one more chance for some old-fashioned fun. Lancer grinned ferociously as he pounced on Shuru's desperate defense, pounding the reinforced metal into a dented mess. Worst of all, it was painfully obvious that he was fooling around. Excellent work, young man. What about this? He yelled as he swung his polearm in a massive strike that blew Shuru out of the window he had purposefully backed himself up against. An instant later, the spearman appeared, his spear already in motion. Shuru needed some space, and he only had one option. Planting his foot in the grass, he pushed up, both arms still gripping his rapidly deteriorating weapon and unleashed his full force on one swing. Don't. Take me for granted. As he swung his weapon, he roared. G-A-A-A-K-I-N. The impact of the canister on the crimson spear was enough to send it spiraling into the air, where it stabbed into the ground several meters behind the man in blue. 
Lancer looked at the spear, but didn't seem bothered by being disarmed. Shuru knew it was now or never, but he wouldn't dare to look away from his assassin. He took the first step back in a desperate attempt to enter the shed. His adversary returned his gaze to his target and smiled almost friendly. Fly. Bang. Shuru's servant Lancer abruptly vanished from view, and all Shuru could feel was pain. He immediately noticed the man kick him, make him cough blood, and take his weapon. That man had kicked him 20 meters in a single blow. Shuru's knees gave out in a fit of the divine intervention he required, allowing him to fall into the shed as the force of the mist strike slammed the door open. Shuru could only weakly stare at his killer through his blurry vision as he scrambled back a few meters. Checkmate. Lancer grinned and pointed his spear at Shuru, saying, that last move was pretty surprising, boy. Lancer lowers his spear and puts on a thoughtful expression, however, I do not understand. You think quickly, but you're hopeless at magecraft. You still appear to have a talent for it. He narrowed his eyes at Shuru, thinking, perhaps you were born to be a master. He then shrugged and re-readied his spear. Well, even if you were meant to, this is your last chance. He finished just as he was about to strike Shuru down. Shuru was enraged as he glared at the spearman. He had already been saved once, and now the same man comes after him and kills him again. The sheer inequity of dying twice in one day in the same way is infuriating. He was going to die like an insect after everything he had managed to live through, after everything he had endured to approach the ideal of a hero of justice. Fuck this. Shuru muttered as he struggled and sat down, glaring at Lancer as he moved his hand to his chest, where Lancer had previously stabbed him. My life had been spared. My life was saved, so I'm not going down without a fight. He screamed. Unbeknownst to him, the old magical circle behind him began to glow slowly as a result of his will to live. I have to live and fulfill my responsibilities, which I can't do if I'm dead. Sharout murmured bitterly, then clenched his fist, and the blood on his hand slowly transformed into the symbol, I'm not going to be killed, in a place like this. He glared at Lancer, who was preparing to stab Shuru with his spear. For no reason, by a guy like you who kills people for fun. He yelled angrily. Avalon begins to work inside Shuru's body at that point. His magical circuits were glowing with power, and the ritual was responding to his will to survive, the sheath referred to as its sword. The promised victory sword. Suddenly, a typhoon with blinding light appears and blocks Lancer's spear, causing a shower of sparks and widening his eyes. Is there another servant? So there is an extra one in this war. He murmured before his eyes caught movement and he raised his lance to deflect an invisible force's sudden strike. The strike was powerful enough to blow him away from the old house and outside. Lancer skidded to the ground and balanced himself as he took stance. Without a doubt, this kid summoned the last servant. It was actually surprising when he met assassin in Ryudu temple last midnight. He already met an assassin that night, but when he checks the temple, he meets another. That's it for today. If you enjoy this video, give it a big thumbs up and subscribe to my channel for more awesome stories like this. Thank you. See you all in my next video.